On this third Sunday of Advent, we have already welcomed the, the hope of the world. We welcomed the peace, the shalom of God, and this day we welcome love that has arrived among us, that has been among us, that we hope will be rekindled among us anew. The Kramers lit the candle this morning, and I don't know about, about you, but I rather enjoyed it. 27 years of being at this, and that their love had been encapsulated a beautiful family. And who knows where it will pick up. It's not as if we don't talk about love. Marty's walking out. I'll just say a moment about Marty before you leave. One of the things that I wanted to speak about is, gosh, we talked about love. We did a whole series on love and relationships. And I thought that was done. And I was sitting with Marty and Bob Pearson in a meeting the other day, and we were talking about the Thanksgiving table at the Steinman home. And I think somehow the love language book came up. Remember that? We talked about the five love languages. Did you actually make everybody at the table take that test? Did no. she make you all take that test? What are you talking about? But uh, you got 100% of what? <laughs> <laughs> of what, dear? <laughs> So it's, it, this thing is inexhaustible love. We can take all kinds of tests on it. We can speak about it. We can practice it. But, but still, there's probably not a subject that's more preached about in Scripture than love. And like we so. And, and I think it's an appropriate topic for this season of Advent because what the love, and a crazy love at that, could send one's only child into the world except love itself. And for a larger purpose than you and I could ever understand, why would you do that? You know the story, I know the story, that every year it catches me by surprise again as I think about the beauty and the wonder of God's grace. How is it that year after year, day after day, month after month, you and I are deserving of this? The story of God's grace for us reminds me of those of us who parent, who can't help but sometimes, time and time again, to rescue our children when they sometimes need to learn the hard lessons, yeah? Where we need to let them fall to learn what it means to be a better person. But yet, like God, we continue to love deeply and gracefully. The question of the hour is this, how can we love as deeply and as wondrously as God loves? When I thought about the theme, I always like to think about songs that might have some direct relation. And I grew up in the 60s and 70s, which was a great ride, by the way. I absolutely loved it. Back in September of 1977, when I was 16 years old, you can do the math, there was a British pop ballad trio that came out with the second single for the official soundtrack of the 1977 movie, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> you know the group, right? My heart drops. I mean, geez, I'm, I'm liking me some Andy, Andy and Maurice, but I'm really loving me some Barry. Really <laughs> loved Barry. And there were several different songs on that track. You know, the Night Fever said, Staying Alive More Than a Woman, If I Can't Have You. But the song that I'm talking about, How Deep Is Your Love? How Deep Is Your Love? I really need to know. Because we're living in a world of what? Fools. Breaking us down when they all should let us be. We belong to you and me. How deep? How deep is your love? It's both a practical question, but I think more it's a deeply theological question. Because there's not a one of us that doesn't want to know that we are beloved by someone as deep and as long and as wide as it could possibly be. There's not a one of us that doesn't want to know that, that we're loved unconditionally, no matter what we look like on our wedding day and what we look like now. There's not a one of us that doesn't want to know that, that even in the midst of difficult times, that that person that we love is going to stay in the ring with us, even at times when they don't really like us, that they're going to be there. Whether that's, whether that's in a marital relationship or a child relationship or a family relationship, we want to, we want to know that. And we want to know that, as I mentioned, if times get tough, that that person is not going to leave us. How deeply theological is that? That's the way that God loves. Even babies 
make it clear to us that they need the assurance that when we leave the room, we're coming back. Jump ahead another 10 years, and I'm getting ready for, actually, in the midst of seminary, and one Roberta C. Bondi, who was a church historian and monastic scholar, who was destined to be my seminary professor in 1987, wrote, the book, which is probably her best and classic book called To Love as God Loves. And in this book, she takes us through a journey of the desert with the monastics and helps us understand how their life can be so applicable to the life that we lead today because people then didn't understand their love. They misunderstood the way they loved, the way they practiced their faith, just like they often understand us today. And she talks about God's love throughout the whole book, including the depth of God's love, the authenticity of God's love, the resilience of his love, the foreverness of his love, and the humility in God's love. She begins her book with this clever existential teaser, which means a question about our existence. Many of us, she said, call ourselves Christians but we cannot see how to do it based on our cultural assumption, our culture's assumption that to be a human being fully means that we're all about individual self-development. To be a human being, she says, the goal of humanity is to develop ourselves individually. And if that's what culture says, then how does that leave space for you and I to love? Because if you love, you risk everything. You risk all the things that you could do for yourself, have for yourself, be to the world. Is there room for love in a culture that teaches that self-development is what it's all about? Well, deep in our hearts as Christians, we know that it's probably not that way. But often we fall into that trap because it's as the world does. In the early church, they struggled with the same things that we do this day, trying to live a countercultural life in a world that doesn't understand, trying to live a life that asks these questions. <coughs> you save your life, or states these things, you save your life by giving it away. How much sense does that make? Trying to live in a, a culture that doesn't understand that not only do you forgive 70 times, but you forgive what? Seventy times seven. Try to live in a culture where you pray for your enemies and those who hurt you. The world didn't understand the monastics. The world doesn't always understand us. The early church fathers said that the premise of all individual life, at the base of everything, is the goal to live a life of love. And if we live a life of love, then we're going to develop as individuals along the way. We're going to be better than we could have ever been. But the purpose of living in a Christian vernacular, the goal of life is to love. To love more fully and richly and deeply. To love in such a way that disarms the world. That disarms the violence that was a part of their world in those days and our world now. To live like Martin Luther King Jr., or to live like the current Pope Francis. Look at all that he's put at risk for the sake of love and showing a new way to live and be in the world. The early monastics believe it's only as we learn to love God and others do we gain real freedom and autonomy. Because otherwise, we are a slave to self-interest. And the world is full of folks that are slave to self-interest. In loving God and others, we set ourselves free. We are free. Sometimes that we think that we don't have the capacity to love that deeply and that richly. The first question in your bulletin, I ask you, when is the time that you have ever practiced irrational love? Or let's look, look at it this way, selfless love. What have you done in the name of selfless love? Is that something we want to speak about? Crazy things that you've done because you've 
put somebody else first or put another cause first. And they are both in number saying, but you did it anyway because you couldn't not do it. Like my friend Judy, whose younger brother had spent most of his life cut off from her and had lived a rather raucous uh, existence, but he was dying of kidney disease. And she said, well, I've got something I can do for you. So she gave her kidney to him. Not because it made sense, but because that's what love demanded. I was sad to learn that in June of this year, she lost her own battle with cancer. But she left the world with one less kidney, which is exactly the way she wanted it to be. After nearly 30 years of hearing sermons on this text that, that John read to you were preaching them, was saying, I've come to believe that Mary of Nazareth must have been an old soul. There must have been something about her that God chose. Why did he choose her womb over all the others? What was it about her? What kind of 13 or 15 year old do you know like that? I'm sorry, there's a lot of good ones among us, but I don't know many like that. What was, was it her faith? Was it her life of prayer? I mean, really think about it. What, what was it? Was it her resilience? Because God knew she would need it with what she would face. She had this uncharacteristic humility and selflessness as, as a child herself. And then we can't forget that she was a courageous and tenacious soul. Who stops an angel in mid-sentence and says, hold up? How can this be? Like a precocious child or a biology major, how can this be? <laughs> Joseph and I have never, we would never, God forbid that we should ever, it was surely for love that Mary said yes. It was a girl who chose not a life of self-fulfillment, but a life of love. In John Wesley's vernacular, Mary possessed not a halfway love, not the pretense of love, but an altogether love. A love that's all in, that's willing to take a personal risk. I've told you several times about my friend Karen and her husband Bobby, who were killed in a tragic car accident in 1995 when a woman over the top on a concoction of alcohol and cocaine slammed into their car. They were both killed instantly. They were my youth counselors. They left in the back of their car an 18-month-old who survived miraculously. She was in a halo for some time. I'll call her Sarah for the purposes of today's sermon. She's now a happy and successful 25, almost 26-year-old. After her parents' senseless death, Sarah was lovingly raised by her auntie and uncle, Lee and Tanya, who after years of trying to conceive were not able to do so, and they were then able, able to make a home for Sarah, and they adored her. One night when I was on the phone with Karen because we were both pregnant together and we would exchange stories about how what was happening inside of us. One night when I was on the phone with her, she got really quiet and said, I want to tell you something, true story. I want to tell you something. Bobby and I have really been praying about this and we've made this decision and I want to know what you think about it. We've decided that when this baby is born, we're going to give our womb to Tanya. We're going to give our womb to Tanya. I'm going to serve it the proxy a baby for her because I'm going to help her and she wants one. What do you think, she said. And all I can think is, how deep is your love, Karen? How deep is your love? Karen was never able to see that one day Tanya was able to go ahead and conceive on her own. And that these two children would be raised together, cousins, now sisters. But had she lived, I'm absolutely convinced that if Tanya had not been able to conceive, Karen would have lent her womb to her as she had promised. That kind of love is irrational. It doesn't make sense to the world. It's as crazy as you going next door and do an alternative Christmas for gifts of hope. Good grief. Who ever heard of it? It's as crazy as you going to Africa to build homes and helping AIDS kids. It's as crazy as people who go out in the community and work suicide hotlines because they can't stand to see another life lost. 
Preparing for the sermon, my research took me to some interesting places. And when I typed in love and forgiveness, which is the second question in the bulletin, a new face popped up on the screen for me. A tall, lanky, silver-haired woman with prominent cheekbones and deep set eyes. Her name was not new, at least her surname was not. It was Klebold. Does that ring a bell for you? Sue Klebold is the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the two shooters at Columbine High School in 1999 that killed 12 students, one teacher, and injured 24. And she says, far beyond the 24 whose lives were scarred by what her son did. Since the massacre, she says that she has spent years excavating every detail of her family life, trying to understand what she could have done to have prevented the tragedy. In 2016, after years of evading public scrutiny, Klebold published this book, A Mother's Reckoning, Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy. It's a powerful, powerful memoir in which she explores the crucial relationship between health awareness, mental health awareness, and intervention. She is now an advocate for good brain health and for intervention, and she donates, has donated all proceeds of her book to mental health and suicide prevention. With the 13 that died that day, it's daunting to hear her because I followed her all week on interviews and in reading about her book. It's daunting to hear her talk about the 13 that died and because of what her son did and Eric Harris, that they were even given the privilege of being counted among the dead. There were really 15 dead that day because these two boys took their life. It's equally formidable to hear her describe her 20 mile drive back to Littleton after the shooting started, where she was convinced that her son was in harm's way, only to learn that her son was the one causing the harm. She worked as a special assistance for disabled persons in the community homes. This was a woman who knew about the law. She said when she finally learned that it was her son who was committing the massacre, that she did the unthinkable for any mother. She said she prayed that somehow this would stop, even if it meant that her son had to die. And then she said she regretted having said that, and then she went back and agreed that what mother would not want to extend forgiveness, but at the same time want the pain to stop? She makes Dylan very human as I close out the sermon today. Despite it all, she was still Dylan's mother. And through her writing, she makes him real to us. A day does not pass that I don't feel a sense of overwhelming guilt, both for the myriad ways that I failed my son and for the destruction he left in his way. I think often of watching him when he was a fourth grader doing origami. I love to make a cup of tea and sit beside him, watching his hands move as quickly as he made hummingbirds. Delighted to see him turn a square of paper into a frog or a bear or a lobster. I always marvel at how something as straightforward as a piece of paper can be completely transformed with only a few creases to become suddenly something replete with new significance. And then I marvel at the finished form that the complex folds that were hidden that were unknowable to me. And in many ways, that experience mirrors what I would, after Columbine, have done. I would have thought what I, I would have thought that I knew my son and my family inside out. And I watched my boy become a monster. And then I watched him become a boy. If you really want to see the power of love and forgiveness that she extended to her son, how she was able to try to forgive herself for not recognizing his warning signs and for how she tried to say, I'm sorry to all of those families for which words weren't enough. Watch her 15 minute TED talk. You'll see the power of love. As I close, I offer this. John Wesley believed with all of his heart that even though the world was his parish and that we can best be Christians together, he believed that the root of all self-development of all learning to live in love and humility started in private devotion. So where Sue Klebold stayed out of public scrutiny for seven years, she did her work behind the scenes. So when it was time to speak, she was there. We've all got hard
hard work to do and what it means to love more deeply and fully, to love what the first Corinthians text says, to, to be patient and kind, to have a love that doesn't envy, that doesn't boast, that's not proud, that doesn't dishonor others when they aren't there to defend themselves. We all need work on a love that's not self-seeking or not easily angered, a love that keeps no record of wrongdoing, a love that doesn't delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. My challenge to each of us is to pick one or two of those areas where we know where our Achilles heel is, where we know we don't love as fully and deeply as we should. And watch to see how God will develop a deep, deep love in us, like the world we live in and like the world's so desperate.